Squid Game. Last time we discussed its connection was French philosopher Michel Foucault. If you missed that one, the link is in the top right corner right now, and also in the link description. This time we'll talk about late capitalism and the freedom that's kinda there that also not there in our society. We will mostly deal with the philosophy, but in the context of the series. If you're interested in more of this stuff, subscribe and click the bell! Now, to talk about late capitalism, we have to talk about early capitalism. To talk about that, we need to discuss classical liberalism, the quintessence of capitalist philosophy. Classical liberalism is not the same as the Democratic Party establishment ideology in the United States today. In an American context, liberals are usually typified by an advocacy for some governmental participation in the economy, relatively higher taxes, and sometimes progressive social policies, whereas classical liberalism advocates for civil liberty, free markets, the rule of law, and the minimal states. Today, we could say that these values would align closer with the conservative parties of capitalist regimes, but back when classical liberalism was developed, that is, the era of the Enlightenment, these ideas were very progressive. Before the Enlightenment, Europe was still largely influenced by absolutism and monarch rule. The idea that the individual person could take back control and defend their property from the arbitrary appropriation of monarchs was a radical step forward. I mean, it would be nice for you to keep everything you labor to create and not have all your stuff stolen by some monarchy, right? Hence the creation of rights. For classical liberals, the most important ones would include the right to life, liberty, and private property. Life and liberty, hopefully we can all agree to that. But private property is an interesting one because there are a couple of problems in terms of the interpretation of this right. The most simple interpretation is that a right to private property means that the owner of this private property can do whatever they want with it. If I own my spoon, I can sell it, use it to eat soup or stir tea or cook heroin. Since I have ownership over this spoon, no one is to tell me what I can do with the spoon. This sounds like a brilliant system as it protects your stuff from being stolen. Classical liberals, by logical extensions, become libertarians and will advocate for protection of property rights as a basis of protecting all rights. Okay, great, but let's do some philosophy while thinking about Squid Game. We see this scene in episode 1 where debt collectors chase down Gi-hoon and make him sign away his physical rights allowing the debt collectors to harvest his kidney should he fail to pay his debts on time. So that was an exercise to freedom of trade, as your body is your property, right? Wait, is your body your property? Without much thought, one is inclined to say yes, because it would be pretty horrifying to think about a world in which you don't own your own body. John Locke, 17th century philosopher, famously wrote that every man has a property in his own person. The labor of his body and the work of his hands, we may say, are properly his. But the problem here is, if the body is a property, can your bodily rights be traded away. For other properties like houses and cars, we acknowledge that the owner has the right to transfer it to another person with or without compensation. Does the same apply to your body, your person? The classical liberal position on this would be, as long as there is no coercive power such as governmental decrees, you should have the liberty to conduct this trade. Granted, it would be hard to find anyone who's actually willing to give up their rights to their own body, but is it reasonable to tell someone who is ready and willing to sell their blood or organs or sexual service that they cannot do so? Classical liberals would say no, it isn't reasonable because that would be the government enforcing an undue restriction over your property rights. You understand this line of logic, you understand modern economic libertarians and conservatives. The theory is that the right to property is fundamental to all other rights and that it ought to be held sacred and protected no matter what. Sure, some stuff could be submitted to the government as taxation, but classical liberals would claim that this follows from a social contract in which citizens effectively pay for the government to perform services like security or infrastructure. Anything more than that will be trespassing on your rights and liberties and would therefore be tyranny.
Do you see the problem? Classical liberalism doesn't work in today's world because the theoretical liberty to choose and the right to decide what to trade is no longer a practical liberty for most people. This is brilliantly portrayed in Squid Game. The players are given the theoretical liberty to sign or not sign on the physical rights waiver. They could have chosen to stay out of gambling, right? Instead, they didn't, borrowed a ton of money, and chose to sign over their rights to their own body. No, that isn't how it works, because gambling like capitalist consumerism and high-stake investments messes with the human brain and exploits inherent biological weaknesses to perpetuate capitalism. Players are given the theoretical liberty to collectively withdraw from the games, but look where that got them. Sang Wu attempted to commit suicide, Gi Hoon found out that he cannot even pay his mother's medical bills, and Sai Biao was extorted by this ugly bastard human trafficker. Knowing the fatal danger, they all returned to the game. This is not just a plot device to make sure that the show does not end at episode 2. This is an over-the-top demonstration of capitalism today. Just look at conservative talking points on poverty. You're poor? Homeless? Just get a job. Just get a job. Trade away products of your own labor at an exploitative rate and barely survive on minimum wage. It's not the system's fault. You're just not good enough. Everyone has the same liberty. Why did you fail? Must be because you are lazy. The system works, you don't, and that's why you're poor. Squid Game shows us that the first assumption of this argument, that the system is neutral, is wrong. The government is no longer the only institution capable of exercising coercive power, and therefore regulating only the government's power is no longer enough. People in liberal democracies may be able to vote for presidents, but they cannot vote for CEOs. The free market appears neutral, and claims to be neutral, but it is not neutral. The system facilitates a violent and unnatural competition by promising desperate people a way out of the dilemma that the system created in the first place. For any one winner in capitalism, there has to be many, many more losers. You are not required by law to trade away your rights, but really do you have literally any other choice? The same Kafka-esque policy applies almost everywhere else under capitalism. You have the right to choose the way in which you are oppressed. The one thing you cannot choose is to opt out of the oppression or attempt to change it. And if you ask the classical liberals why, they will tell you because there is no alternative. And so y'all have to just go with it. Take John Stuart Mill, famous liberal philosopher, prominent early advocate for free speech. When he discusses exceptions to free speech, the example he uses is incredibly telling. He writes on liberty, quote, Even opinions lose their immunity when the circumstances in which they are expressed are such as to constitute their expression a positive instigation to some mischievous act. An opinion that corn dealers are starvers of the poor or that private property is robbery, ought to be unmolested when simply circulated through the press, but may justifiably incur punishment when delivered orally to an excited mob assembled before the house of a corn dealer, or when handed out among the same mob in the form of a placard. So basically, it's okay for you to just write that capitalism is bad, but it's not okay for you to actually go ahead and do anything about it. Hmm. So if you're poor, unable to pay off your debts, what could you really do? Enter the job market and essentially participate in a slower, less blatant version of Squid Game? Get some GameStop stocks or Bitcoin to literally bet on futures? Sure, anyone could eventually win, but not everyone can. Now, Squid Game is fictional. It isn't real. It's excessively violent. Essentially, it isn't quote-unquote normal for us. But it could very well be normalized. Think about the eviction crisis. Think about the student debt crisis and the fierce competition in any marketplace involving people today, from college applications to job applications. The constant anxiety around being quote-unquote eliminated Sure, you might not be literally shot in the head, but if you don't have a stable income source and you're on the verge of bankruptcy, your life would be far from an authentic, good life. 
As Karl Marx writes in his work, Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844, the competition among workers has become all the more intense, unnatural, and violent. Consequently, a section of the working class falls into beggary or starvation just as necessarily as a section of the middle capitalist falls into the working class. Hence, even in the condition of a society most favorable to the worker, the inevitable result for the worker is overwork and premature death, decline to a mere machine, a bond servant of capital, which piles up dangerously over and against him, more competition and starvation or beggary for a section of the workers. Marx was writing in the time of the Industrial Revolution. Conditions have improved from then with the passage of labor legislations and the creation of the welfare state in some countries, but the nature of capitalist competition never changed. With this philosophy in mind, the hypocrisy and irony of the ostensibly neutral administrators of Squid Game becomes apparent. It claims to be a fair world where rule busters are executed and put on public display, yet it clearly segregates the players from the VIPs. Sure, players have an equal start where their strategy and luck determines a lot, but at the end of the day, only one person can win, and all others, no matter how virtuous or skillful or nice they were as human beings, are eliminated. Meanwhile, the VIPs are safely shielded behind a veil of anonymity and are definitely not expected to participate in the games. The system claims to be neutral or an equal, but there are unsaid assumptions about who this equality applies to and to what extent they are equal. The players are equally likely to die of a bullet whereas the VIPs equally enjoy the spectacle and receive luxurious treatments. Some are more equal than others. The slime once used by George Orwell to mock Stalinist communism can now perfectly fit the capitalist order in terms of its discourse of equal rights. It is not about what is said, oftentimes it is more about what isn't said. Similarly, we can look at the votes to withdraw from Squid Game with this philosophy. Firstly, it does not change anything, you are still in financial ruins. Secondly, the power to decide ultimately rests on the capitalist, as we eventually see in the last episode the true identity of O Il Nam as the game master. And thirdly, democracy is used as a guise for consent. When two options are both equally you can't say that voting for the less one demonstrates the people's elaborate enthusiasm for eating Freedom is illusory under liberal capitalism. And I am definitely not saying, okay, liberal democracy is bad, let's do Stalinism or fascism then. No, just because we reject one kind of unfreedom does not mean we should default to the other. Nor am I drawing any equivalence. There are too many intricacies in this comparison, which I'm not qualified to talk about. What I'm saying, however, is that we need to recognize present injustices no matter the presence or absence of viable alternatives and sustain the spirit of criticism to any other kind of system. Personally, this line of thought leads me to the conclusion that any large-scale organization of state apparatuses, be it neoliberal capitalism, Stalinism, or fascism, inevitably leads to tyranny, unfreedom, and invites Kafka's ghost back in the house. But I'm not telling you what to think, this is for yourself to decide. I personally think this is the most significant anti-capitalist message that you can take from Squid Game. I realized that throughout the course of this video, I've been mostly talking about philosophy and not the show, and that is because if you want to see content summaries or character analysis or behind the scenes, you would have gone to some other big name YouTube channels already. And as always, please leave criticism down in the comments. Tell me if you think I'm completely wrong about the show. That's how philosophy works from arguments and thoughtful criticism. Next time, we're going to pick up our conversation from Marx and talk about alienation. See you later in the next video.